Um, I'm Steve Fitzhugh. I'm recently re-retired from Norwich University. I was a professor of electrical and computer engineering for 18 years, and I re tried retiring for a year, and then they had dragged me back to be the interim provost for a year. So I finally got out of that. So I'm, I'm back to being retired. Um, so it's my pleasure to, to uh, if you will, co-moderate this panel with Alyssa. And Alyssa, why don't you? Hi, everyone again. I'm Alyssa Brink. I am an architecture major here at Norwich, and I am also a research fellow grant recipient. So um, this is actually a wonderful panel to be on because it all works so nicely with my research and my major here. So I'm also very excited to be here to um, experience all of this with everyone here. And so I think first thing, if you would indulge me, uh, if we could just go around the room, um, starting with you, and just say, give your name and, and who you're with. It's just. Okay. I'm Laura Caps, and today I'm a community member from Hinesburg. I'm also a Laura, Laura Brook, a Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. I'm Chris Klein, I'm a retired IT project manager. Hi, I'm Jolien Larson, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Vermont. <laughs> My name is Caroline McKelvey, I uh, work for the University of Vermont on a program called the Champlain Sea Grant. I'm Zoe Niederland from B Trans Planning, Agency of Transportation. I'm Zen, I'm with East Park School. Salem Tucker with East Park School. I'm Nathan Bradshaw, I'm a teacher and co director at East Park School. Okay. I'm Carl Martin, I'm an associate professor at this year at Norwich. Uh, Jeff Campbell, emergency management director for Town of Warren, also one of our chief. Margarita Valenta, climate and energy planner for the Northwest region. Uh, Jack Locker, media undergraduate. Okay, and I'm Gene Krauss on the select board of Bethel. Okay, well, thank you and welcome to all of you. Uh, we look forward to a very interesting panel this morning. Would you like to introduce them or would you like me to introduce them? Um, I can, I. Okay. I wrote it all out Good. so I can introduce <laughs> you all. Um, so, um, just to welcome our guest speakers here today, um, we plan to discuss resilience in, on the climate and energy track, as I'm sure you all know. Um, so today we have with us Michael Cross, um, an assistant professor here at Norwich in Electrical and Computer Engineering, um, Chad Farrell, the founder and CEO of Encore Renewable Energy, and um, Elizabeth Miller, the vice president in Sus Sustainable Supply and Resilient Systems and the chief legal counsel at Green Mountain Power. Yep, and uh, just to start off really quick, we have a two-part question for you guys. Um, just to simply, how do you define resilience related to the energy sector, and what are some examples of the work you guys have done um, here to foster that resilience in Vermont's energy supply? Start? Yeah, we'll see like I feel like though, I mean, I know we're not going to actually do this, but I feel like we should all be like sitting up with all of you because really just right. hearing everybody's affiliation, we might as well just have a conversation. So I'll, I will answer the question, but it would be really great to well, get we, to questions the, the too. The idea is that we're going to, Back unlike, and forth. unlike the other panel, we're going to go through, let each of you have like five minutes. Okay. We'll give you another awesome. question to get you started, and then we're going to open it up. And if we don't Perfect. have enough questions, we'll feed the questions. But we want to have more of a conversation. Okay, good. Today. That's great. Okay. So resilience in the energy system. You know, I'll I'll get a little bit on the soapbox right away and just say I I sort of wish that we'd get beyond the distinction discussion about resiliency versus reliability in the electric sector because it's really all one and the same and it should be treated that way. For years, uh, the electric sector has been um, really governed by needing to keep uh, the lights on for customers first and foremost, making sure power gets delivered safely and reliably. Um, and that reliability um, is something that we're measured on and we take really seriously and at Green Mountain Power our storm response if you ever have experienced an outage as one of our customers I hope you've also experienced our just really tremendous focus on getting folks back on 
And we also focus really strongly on the maintenance of the system. Mike runs our field operations, and he's also a member of uh, the Climate Council's uh, Rural Rural Resiliency Subcommittee. I can't quite remember the. There you go, Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee. Um, and so he could speak if anyone wanted to know directly about how we manage the system. And what we talk about now most is keeping the system resilient, which really goes beyond sort of the way you think about reliability and the metrics of if there is an outage, how many hours was it, and all that. Because what we want is a system that is always on for all of our customers. That's the ultimate goal, right? And the way we can achieve that now in 2022 and beyond is so different than it was even 10 years ago when you think about Irene. We have programs at Green Mountain Power and other utilities around the state and around the country are also starting to roll it out where we can work directly with our customer to create a two-way grid where the customer has solar, the customer has storage, we have our generation resources and the whole interconnected grid, and we can work together. And it's not just about individual uh, resilience at the home, it's about the community. Because if you have solar and storage and you're in a neighborhood and your neighborhood suffers an outage, we can rely on your resource with our grid to help keep folks on by microgridding. And then similarly, if, if there's a situation regionally, our grid can be helpful to the community and the individuals in Vermont. So it really should be more of a two-way system and the way I think of, of resiliency is that community connectedness, making sure people can stay on and stay you know, healthy and strong when it's a natural disaster, if it's a cyber disaster, you know, things that we need to respond to, we have the ability to do it quickly and as a community in Vermont. Great, I can, I can pick up from there. Um, so yeah, when we think about resiliency, and I, I really like how you sort of like trying to break down yeah. that barrier between resiliency and reliability, we need it all, right? So I do think about you know things like what Mike has been working on at, at Green Mountain Power in terms of hardening the grid, making it more resilient to you know freak storms and uh, and, and and reducing the number of outages uh, from you know weather-based events, which are going to be you know increasingly unpredictable, increasingly uh, intense. Um, so the hardening of the grid is really important. But I think as we're making this transition. Um, I think of reliability and resiliency from the local standpoint, right? So it's basically, you know, how do we, and we're seeing this put in stark, um, you know, just right in front of our faces with the war in Ukraine, right? Like, we need to get away from being sort of subject to um, hostile <laughs> governments that, um, you know, are, 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 you know, propped up by fossil fuels. And so... So what we think about is sort of bringing all the generation and moving it to a true distributed network, right? Moving away from centrally produced, you know, gigawatt scale uh, nuclear plants and, and, and coal plants and, and, and really sort of distributing that generation throughout the grid. Um, and that's, you know, sort of both at the larger scale all the way down to the residential scale. And that... Um, that is, all of these projects are actually helping to stabilize the grid, right? Every time we interconnect a project and we, you look at another vessel and the warming uh, creates pressure, which spins a turbine also. So, and those technologies, that technology is, you know, you can get up to a day or two. So, and it's large scale, utility scale stuff. So we're getting there. It's, it's gonna be a really exciting decade, much like solar was last decade. Um, because, as I said, the, the, the price points just continue to improve. The technology continues to improve with scale. Um, and, um, and, and adoption is, is really taking off right now, as, as evidenced by what Green Mountain Power has been doing from the residential scale up to the utility scale. hope that answered your question. Mike, Mike, you'd like to add? I just saw a really cool problem for my first year engineering course. <laughs> How long will Lake Champlain last? if we take the water and split it into hydrogen and oxygen and run a fuel cell from Lake Champlain. Uh, no, seriously, fuel cells are another option we haven't talked about yet, but green, green hydrogen technology and using solar to make uh, hydrogen. We focus on larger scale uh, renewable energy projects, mostly solar and large energy storage projects. Every time we interconnect one of those larger projects into the grid, we are making improvements to that grid. We are making it more resilient. And um, 
And that's that, you know, so the more projects we do, the more resilient the grid gets. And so, and then when we have the power generated locally, you know, we can do things like what Liz is talking about with, with islanding and microgrids and, you know, down to the household level, these can be ind independent power plants that can be choreographed by the utility as they've done in, in their um, battery storage residential program. Um, that can also happen at the larger scale as well. So really it's, it's fostering an environment where we can uh, build these projects locally to serve us locally and not have to rely on, you know, transmission lines that can get knocked out, like I'm dating myself now, but back in the ice storm of 1998, if any folks were around, all those transmission lines coming down from, from Quebec were just completely, um, you know, frozen over with ice and collapsed. And you, we see similar, um, you know, we've seen similar instances recently in Texas last winter when they lost their grid. Um, and then there was those iconic photos of like the one house on a block of McMansions that had, you know, solar panels on the roof and a, clearly a battery in the basement um, because the lights were on, everything else is blacked out. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, and, and one last thing I'd like to say, just another prop for Green Mountain Power here as, as really like we're fortunate to have Green Mountain Power in the state innovating and leading the way and, and showing other utilities what progressive utility management uh, can look like and, and why it's so important. You know, I, I, the, 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 the concept of trying to move towards zero outages in the next 10 or 15 years, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty incredible. And, we're going to do that by by developing local sources of energy for our own consumption here in Vermont. So as we're going down the list here, you guys are taking all my key words away. <laughs> but I'll throw in a couple more. I teach the uh, first year engineering course here at Norwich, and we talk about energy and we talk about resiliency, and uh, we define it. And two of the key words that kind of stick in my mind is respond and adapt. So being able to respond to an event but being able to learn from that event and be able to adapt to it to changing times. And these ideas of uh, flexible load management, utility controlled, um, vehicle to grid, house to grid type uh, resources, that's what we're going to need to do in order to make the, the, the grid more resilient and be able to respond and be able to adapt to a changing environment. So that was short, but they took all the good words from me. So. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. And in full disclosure, <laughs> uh, some people could say, hey, you stacked the deck here with, uh, with your panel. But um, I've as been a professor at Norwich, so Mike, uh, I did not invite Mike on the panel. I didn't select the panel members, but uh, I have taught in, in that group. Uh, Chad Farrell, uh, Encore, is working on a solar project uh, with uh, VEPSA, the Vermont Public Power Supply Authority, of which Northfield Electric is a member, and um, and they're working on. I I work with Northfield Electric Department, and so we we've, we've been working on the solar project. And Green Mountain Power has been doing a lot of contract line work and restoration for Northfield uh, for over 20 years, and so uh, we have a, a good relationship. Uh, with Green Mountain Power and, and, uh, and their innovation as well. So it's always a small world. Always a small world, and uh, so I did not invite them on the panel, so it's it's not a conflict of interest. So, um, but so I want to ask the first question and kind of pose it to the entire panel, and then we'll open it up. Um, so I've written this out. Vermont has invested significantly in PV. I mean, you know, we've got this big project coming in here now, resulting in potentially less diversity. And our power supply, everybody wants to de depend on the PV, and we've moved away from a lot of other plants. And so um, that's given us uh, less diversity in the power supply mix um, and greater intermittency because our resources, the solar, we only get it in the daytime and we don't get as much in the winter when the sun is down. So how has this impacted grid stability and resilience? I'd be happy to start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I appreciate the question because to me and to Green Mountain Power as we look at, I, I help lead power supply for Green Mountain Power, so it's a, you know, it's a question we 
think about every day. When we think about it at Green Mountain Power, it's really all sources. I mean, we think about the way our portfolio should deliver power to customer across resources and believe that solar has an incredibly important role to play now and in the future, and it needs to grow in order to do that, especially as we all electrify, hopefully, to get off fossil fuel in our transportation and heating and other aspects of our life, we are going to need uh, more generation in state. And that should be, as Ch I think, Chad, you were the one who said, of all scales, really. Um, you know, the traditional centralized power plant that traditionally was fossil fuel based or nuclear based really needs to uh, become smaller scale, more localized, even down to the house level. And in Vermont, it's true that, uh, that PV solar is uh, the leading resource that's been put out. We have some wind resource in the state of Vermont, and there might be some ability to have wind in the future. Um, but solar is going to be a continuing resource here. And we think of the grid and the way that it operates as a 24-7, 365 system. And so you're absolutely right that what we need to do is meet energy needs at all hours, all seasons, all year. And we need diverse resources to do, to do that. So um, a, a, a thing we would urge as people think about the system uh, now and going forward is to support that diversity and to be open to uh, solutions that are local as well as regional um, and of all types, because all types play a role. Um, we have at Green Mountain Power a diverse uh, portfolio of local hydro that we own and operate. That is about 9 or 10 percent of our resource in a year. It depends on how much rain falls and, and how the system operates. We also have regional hydro, both from the Connecticut River system as well as from Quebec coming down, um, that supports our system in really important ways, particularly in the wintertime and at night. And that resource uh, uh, is something that Vermonters need to keep the lights on all the time. And then we have uh, other resources, including uh, PV solar in a growing proportion. G GMP led uh, the net metering policy, what, 15 years ago by putting a solar adder in place. The state then adopted that policy statewide and net metering has been a really important resource. And now we're heading into kind of, you know, almost 20 years um, and we need to and have been thinking about how to make that resource uh, work for us going forward, which is my last point, and that's storage. Because solar paired with storage has the ability to keep solar um, generating for Vermonters in a sense, even when the sun is down. And so finding cost effective ways to make that work for Vermonters as solar is deployed in the state will be increasingly important. Great. Great. Yeah, <clears throat> a, lot, a lot of good stuff there. Um, so first on uh, the resource sort of allocation, yeah, I, I, I agree, it's got to be everything, right? Um, and unfortunately right now, there's essentially a de facto moratorium on wind projects in the state of Vermont. Um, the Public Utility Commission um, passed a sound standard four or five, three, four or five years ago. That is really almost impossible to meet. Um, so. It's great to see so many young people here because I know a lot of young people look at wind turbines a lot differently than some of the older folks in our communities, and that's uh, I think that's what's going to that's what's going to that's what it's going to take. If we want to have wind in this state, we've got to advocate for it, um, and because it's a perfect complement to solar, um, generation profile is much more focused on the winter months and at night. Uh, obviously, solar is the opposite of that, um, so. I'd love to see us get back to being able to develop some, some wind projects here in the state of Vermont. Um, I'll also pick up the concept of storage. You know, one of the most exciting things in the energy space right now is the advent of energy storage. And energy storage is, you know, it's on a similar sort of cost decline curve that solar was the last decade. And that's why solar is so uh, prominent in the energy mix here in Vermont. <clears throat> it's just the economics are really, really favorable. Um, so, but to Liz's point and everybody's understanding, you know, the sun doesn't shine at night, doesn't shine on really cloudy days, and it's tough to generate a meaningful amount of electricity from solar in the winter months in Vermont. Um, it's just not a lot of sunlight. And so, um, so a couple things. So storage is going to help us increase what's known as the capacity factor 
of solar. So um, basically you pair um, a battery with, with a solar project and instead of having a 15, 18% capacity factor, you've now more than doubled that. So it's basically extending, it's, it's basically allowing us to dump electrons into the grid that were generated by renewable energy during the day, dumping those into the grid at, in the evening hours when we are now experiencing our, our peak demands because there's so much, there's a decent amount of solar on the grid. Um, so yeah, so storage is gonna play a really, really big role and again at all scales from residential up to utility scale. Um, so it's, it's really exciting sort of the advancements of, in technology and, and now we're st starting to see not only shorter duration storage technologies make the market and there's always a difference between what's technically feasible and technically you know, possible and what's financeable, what the banks will get behind. And the banks are firmly behind short duration storage in the form of lithium ion at this point but there are some longer duration storage technologies that are really starting to get a lot of attention in the capital markets and you know they're being proven out um, and so it's exciting to see um, some longer duration you know 12 24 36 hour kind of storage but that's still not going to address the energy needs that we have in the winter time in in a northern state like Vermont so there's a really awesome podcast that I, I got I listened to last summer. It's called The Big Switch. If you guys, students, want to check it out, um, it's uh, this woman, Dr. Melissa Lott from Columbia Energy Center. And um, she had, the, you know, it was like a five part podcast series that ran last summer. And she basically sort of made the analogy of the energy system like a soccer team. And, and it, was, it was just the metaphor is, is great, right? So you need, like, on a soccer team, you need the forwards, right, to be you know, fast moving, like scoring goals, but really only on only on half the field, right? And then you've got your midfielders, and that can be like nuclear and other forms of technology um, and storage. And then you've got you know your fullbacks, um, and those could be the fossil fuel generators, right? We're still going to need to have some natural gas in the mix. To, to supply energy during these these winter months when 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 the the renewable resources are not not performing the way they do in the summer months um, especially solar so uh, I thought that and then you know and then there's a, the goalie and I can't remember what the goalie was the goalie might have been like I don't know maybe the goalie was nuclear uh, but it was like you know you, you, we do need those base load technologies we just want to turn down the gas a little bit. And so the more renewables that we have that's paired with storage, the less we need um, those gas plants and that, but we're still likely going to need some element of base load generation and some of that is going to be served by natural gas. I love that the utility person sitting next to you is probably like, like most likely to disagree with that. <laughs> I mean, I'm really hoping that by 20, 35, 40, whatever, even quicker would be great. Yeah. We have resources that don't require us to keep yeah. natural gas. I know yeah. that's that's something that, that we look forward to and how to plan for that. Anyway. I love hearing that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so I think the, the greatest opportunity for diversification is probably going to be in storage. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, there's lithium ion batteries, Tesla power walls. Uh, so you can store those locally. If we get to my presentation, I'll show you a picture of a vehicle that was powered by a grid scale battery technology. So you can have non-lithium grid scale size storage. Uh, you can spin a flywheel during the day and you know do a small scale local community based um, energy storage with excess solar. Pump storage, not so much in Vermont, but that's an opportunity. But there's a lot of different opportunities for storage. And I think with renewable technologies, that's what you need. And we're going to have to explore all the different types of storage technologies available to really be diversified and resilient, to use the word. Can I say one more thing? Just sure. your, your question was about grid stability. And the only thing none of us talked directly about was the control systems that are necessary. And so I just want to like make sure that's a part of the conversation. Like Even if you have the storage and the solar and the other resources that can balance out, you need to be able to, on a moment's notice, if the clouds come over, actually control those switching. And and so that gets back to uh, utility roles in the community and obviously the regional grid operator, but also the way everything has to coordinate in communications. And in a state like Vermont, I just don't want um, the, 
the conversation not to include communications and broadband con connectivity, which will be so important. Yeah. Um, yeah. So part yeah, of the conversation. And, that, and that's a, an excellent point that you bring up. And unfortunately, Dan Nelson was not able to join us today from Belco, but Belco, uh, the Vermont Electric Power Company, which is the uh, Transmission electric transmission company in Vermont that's owned by all of the utilities um, has invested through ISO New England um, in a, a robust fiber network throughout the system which the utilities all share in. So, um, yes, and that, that helps with communications and the controls of the systems to be able to minute by minute virtually monitor the performance of the system, the flow of energy, and, and where there are going to be overloads if, if the clouds come over. So, yes. And so it's a good point. Thank you, Liz. Okay. So let's open it up. Does anyone in the audience have a question? So I saw that hand first. So go ahead. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm Laura Capp. So I'm really interested in long duration energy storage and also looking at what our, what our grid infrastructure looks like once we are 100% renewable. So I've been really excited to talk to you all as a panel. And my question has to do, it's two parts. The first part is, um, what percent of the grid would you like to maintain for critical loads and service for how long during an emergency outage? And then if you do look forward into that future time span of when everything is 100% renewable and you're looking at long duration energy storage, how much do you think that we're going to need to have in the state? And have you started to looking into different technologies? Chad, I know you've been looking at different options. Yeah. You know, we've got a lot of slopes, so advanced rail, maybe? I don't know. There's a lot, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I'll take the first part. Okay. I think I'll, both of you would be probably better okay. suited for the second part. Yep. When it comes to um, our, well, we think of all of our customers as critical, of course, and we work hard to keep all of them on. And literally, uh, when a storm happens, if you were at a GMP office, you would see any or all of us calling customers, trying to connect, let them know what the situation is. Having said that, we absolutely map the critical uh, functions in the community um, and think about that when we're restoring. And we have um, a program right now called Resiliency Zones. I'll just talk about it super quickly because I think it gets to what you're asking. And that is where we look at communities uh, based upon the types of reliability they have experienced. If there are communities that Frankly, over the years, because we're rural, we have had areas of the state where it's more challenging to keep the lights on. We probably all know that and have experienced it either ourselves or with our friends and family. Um, so we know where those areas are, and we overlay the communications infrastructure, what we know about that, and then what's called the social vulnerability index that the CDC uses to understand from an economic and social justice point of view and a health point of view where our customers are that might need the most help. And what we've done is create um, essentially a matrix of communities based on those metrics and identified where resiliency zones could be best uh, suited. So, so far we've started with three communities. We're working in Rochester, Grafton, and uh, Brattleboro. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about the individual projects, but the basic idea is to locate places in communities where um, more people could be served in, an, in a natural disaster or other disaster um, if, if there were a need, um, and making sure you can microgrid, for example. Um, we don't right now have the um, uh, specific metric on your question of how many hours. Typically, it's 8 to 12 hours with management if you have the ability to microgrid or use uh, you know, direct solar that you can stretch that longer. But certainly as we create these resili resiliency zones, that's the sort of resiliency we're looking to provide. Um, and it needs to get longer and better for those critical areas. Um, we're talking hospitals, emergency management, you know, um, transportation infrastructure so that uh, trucks can come if roads need to be repaired and that sort of thing. Cover 100% if you could, yeah. but if you were if you were thinking about it, like what's the minimum percentage you would like to be able to maintain? It really depends on the community, Mike. I don't know if you have any better sense of that, but some communities with with certain uh, either customers or facilities, it might be a higher percentage than others. So it really takes a pretty granular look, is my sense. I don't think I could give you a statewide answer that would really help. I don't know what you if, think. If I would address that, I would say we started with the storage programs in, in the individual homes with one 5kW battery. And we quickly found out that that was harder for the customers to manage 
and then we switch to a 10 kW. So your answer on I know you'd like to serve the whole load would be what I would say for the storage too. We, we aren't, it, it's just hard for people to, people naturally say during a long duration heavy wet snow event, let's keep the furnace and the fridge on. But you know, for 90% of the other storms, they don't really want the inconvenience. And in an in in emergency situation in a town, we want the government buildings to be able to run. So right now we're not putting that in and saying only run your load at 50%. So uh, the goal is to, within reason, try to keep it as normal as we can. When you planned this winter for potential load shedding, which, you know, thank God we had decent weather this winter and everything was fine and we have resources to help cover that, but I know you planned for it. Two to three hours. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so like right now, when you think about the worst case situation and planning for it, that's how, that's how the planning was done. And I'll just add, you know, as uh, working with Northfield Electric Department, with some of the resources that we now have in town and some of the planning that we're doing, we would look at just the, the downtown, part of the downtown area to, to create a microgrid because that's where the service is, the police, the fire. Um, unfortunately, the ambulance is probably not close enough by, but services where people can get food and, and municipal access try to keep the lights on in that particular area. Because originally, back in 1897, yeah. when Northfield Electric was created with the Dog River, using it as hydro, um, that was the, the small community there had electricity. And so I would like to get us back to, at the very least, if we have a, a continued outage, that we would be able to supply the downtown areas. Yeah, I could add. Um, Yes, we're seeing more and more of this. I mean, again, GMP leading the way. Um, the project that was focused in Time Magazine last year um, regarding the Panton project, which is a, an islanded circuit, technically not a microgrid, because you basically just wall off the circuit. Um, we, we're, we're doing a project with Middlebury College right now um, that is a five megawatt solar generator. Um, <clears throat> which is going to generate renewable energy credits for the college's Energy 2028 decarbonization initiative. And it's, it's about a third of that. It's a solid pillar of it. But, you know, GMP was interested in also siting a battery on that same site um, because, A, we've got interconnection uh, capacity there, and, B, um, the Porter Hospital also sits on that, on that circuit. So in the event, you know, so, you know, still be able to run critical hospital functions, certainly not maybe the full hospital, but you'd be able to run critical care um, in the event of a massive, you know, transmission outage. Um, so, and just, I guess, to get to your question about other types of storage technologies, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's fast moving right now. So lithium ion, as I've said, has kind of made the market to this point, but, that taps out at about four hours of discharge at full capacity. Um, so we're really excited about um, iron flow batteries. And because iron is ubiquitous in the United States, we don't have to rely on, on hostile nations, as I was mentioning earlier. Uh, it's a lot more environmentally benign than lithium or worse, cobalt, um, which is, you know, the co or vanadium, which are the other kind of electrochemistries that have sort of made the market. Um, so really excited. There's a company called ESS that just went public. Iron Flow Battery Technology got a massive valuation in the billions, if I'm not mistaken. So that's that's coming, and that'll extend. It's still not technically really long duration, though. So you know, then you start talking about things like pumped hydro, which I think could be really helpful in a in a place like Vermont where we have such topographic um, differences, and um, there are these, I mean, I don't see this happening here, but out west they're building these large, like, lattice structures that lift blocks up, like concrete blocks up when the energy is cheap, mm -hmm. and then they drop them down when energy is expensive, spins a turbine, and, and generates electricity that way. So, um, and then liquefied air is another um, technology uh, that is in development, um, and, you know, that the process is basically super cooling air, uh, down to liquid form, and then uh, and then allowing it to warm another vessel, and the warming 
uh, creates pressure, which spins a turbine also. So, and those technologies, that technology is, you know, you can get up to a day or two. So, and it's large scale, utility scale stuff. So, we're getting there. It's, it's going to be a really exciting decade, much like solar was last decade. Um, because as I said, the, the, the price points just continue to improve. The technology continues to improve with scale. Um, and, um, and, and adoption is, is really taking off right now, as, as evidenced by what Green Mountain Power has been doing from the residential scale up to the utility scale. Hope that answered your question. Mike, Mike, everything you'd like to add? I just saw a really cool problem for my first year engineering course. <laughs> How long will Lake Champlain last if we take the water and split it into hydrogen and oxygen and run a fuel cell from Lake Champlain. Uh, no, seriously, fuel cells are another option we haven't talked about yet, but green, green hydrogen technology and using solar to make uh, hydrogen and storage. You know, hydrogen storage is the issue there. Now you're storing hydrogen, but it could be used as another alternative for storage to help supplement some of that, that demand. Yeah, that's going to be a huge market. Yeah. yeah it's, it's making its comeback. It is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, from this side, there, in the back row, I saw your hand. Yeah, I'm just curious, I feel like I don't hear a lot about methane digesters, and as a really agricultural state, and also looking for that consistency, like year-round and 24 hours, seems like a really good option, um, you know, helps with farm financials, and um, yep. can improve water quality, takes methane out of the air, all, you know, it seems to have a lot of co-benefits, um, the only downside I really know is the big investment it takes, which I would assume with, you know, the focus and how much money is being poured into renewable energy, that should be relatively easy to overcome. Is there a reason it's not a bigger part of the discussion of the model? Like, it, it doesn't really appear in the state. That was a cow power from uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that's and, right and, and, and we do have a number of, of digesters in, in our territory and with our customers. Um, it's a good point in terms of the public conversation and the shift over time, because you're right, cow power was, uh, you know, something that probably had more currency in the conversation a decade or so ago. Many farms that could benefit from it because of the scale did look into it, and some of them went forward and, and built uh, in partnership, um, either with their utility or, or with others. Um, and we do have some larger scale projects uh, around the state that aren't even farm based. Um, uh, and you're right, it's, it's something that is, is still on the table and I know some have continued to look at and we're, we're certainly still open to it. Um, a few projects uh, that Green Mountain Power pursued didn't go forward because there were actually ancillary concerns about some of the impacts um, that do have to be managed in terms of how the feedstock is stored or whether it comes from off-site and what impact it may have on water quality. And so like with all energy choices, this is another thing I think we all know, but I'm just going to say it, there are um, benefits and, and, and drawbacks, right? And so um, that was true or is true with uh, methane digesters as well. There's also um, landfill methane in the state. There are a cute couple different sites, as you probably are aware. So I think that makes a lot of sense, particularly as you point out, because not only does it potentially bring income to the farmer or the landowner, but it also has a potential base load. There also is at least one project, I think, in the state, right, that um, is feeding uh, methane stock into the natural gas system in order to um, make the natural gas system um, less carbon intensive. That one's down in Middlebury as well. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And there are others out of state, uh, like the Fitchburg, yep. Massachusetts, mm -hmm. yep. that uh, we get electricity. That's right. Yeah, that, my, so my, my two cents here is not very well informed two cents, but um, what, I, what we've understood is um, that that technology is really heavily operation and maintenance intensive. So um, you really have to have expertise kind of at the site at least once a week. So one of the concepts that gained traction a number of years ago, and I don't know sort of where it's gone since, was the concept of clustering a bunch of farms together to have shared sort of support uh, from an operations standpoint. Because it's, it, there's, there's corrosivity, um, there's, yeah, it's just these, these machines get, get gummed up and, and they need a lot of maintenance. And that's been an impediment when you have kind of like a standalone project without a lot of others nearby. I don't know if you've studied or anything. Well, I'm actually working on a, a capstone project with our seniors looking at the Essex wastewater facility. So we also have methane from wastewater yeah. Yeah. and uh, their combined heat and power. So I'm wondering 
the scale of that facility versus farms, I don't know the numbers, but I'm wondering if you know a piece of that solution might be wastewater facilities as well. Like I'm not sure if Burlington does. Do they do they, power? They've looked at. It. I don't they think like, they've yet implemented they it, have, but they have looked yeah. at it. I know for sure as yeah. a part of their district heating actually um, initiative. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then the other piece, rather than burning methane in a in a generator, um, because we can extract hydrogen out of natural gas. It's one of the ways you get uh, you get your carbon and then you get your hydrogen, and then you can use the hydrogen in a fuel cell. Can we? modify the process so that you're actually extracting the hydrogen from the methane. So that's just another thought that crossed my mind. Yeah. So, well, I saw a hand over here. Uh, one question about diversity uh, and then a comment. Uh, but there's not only solar and wind, there's also geothermal. And if I understand correctly, especially with your comment about Northfield, and I know Bethel also has a private uh, generator that's running off, off of the White River. Uh, but anywhere there is a moving stream mm -hmm. is a potential hydro generator that does not interfere with the ecology, yeah. uh, like dams do and does not encroach on indigenous lands like our dams do and have historically done ever since the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, so the, any encouragement, uh, I happen to live between two miles, I live in a valley. I have an open space, but I don't have enough sun to put in solar. Uh, the uh, how do how can we incentivize individuals like myself to find alternate sources of energy when we don't fit uh, the uh, <laughs> the mold uh, yeah. and and uh, the uh, well, and, yeah, and the other thing is I firmly believe in the decentralization of power production. And in my opinion, one of the most effective things we could do in the state of Vermont is, by so, put, is for the state to put solar power on every building in the state. And, and why we spend all the money for all these other, now we need the grid, I'm not saying that. No, for, we need but, the grid even more if we did that in some ways. Well, but if we were to, to in, have every building in the state produce what they could, mm -hmm. even if they can't meet their own individual needs, uh, my guess is we could get a whole lot further, a whole lot faster. Yeah. But that's, so. But other sources of energy other than solar, oh, and my comment about wind, I used to live in Appalachian coal country. Please don't <coughs> talk to me about saving mountain tops. Because <laughs> in that country, they take the whole mountain down. Yeah, now we're putting solar projects on top. Of and, and put solar projects, well, no, they use it for coal. And, and uh, uh, so and they take the whole mountain. <coughs> Don't. Anyway. Uh, thank you for that. You wanna... so we can go the other way. You want to start? You want to start? Yeah. I feel like I feel uh, like my yeah. story is getting I, I think it should be more of a, I, I think it should be a federal level decision for solar for everybody. I, I haven't run the numbers for the cost, but give everybody 20 solar panels and a couple power walls and see what happens to the you know the grid issues i think there's a, a good solution there and i think it's i think it's uh, easily financed uh but yeah I, I think you mentioned geothermal i'm wondering why but then you went to the river are you talking about run of river generation or both, taking the energy both. Out of the both. Okay. you've got hydro that can go through any year-round moving water yeah. uh that can be subsurface and you've got uh Geothermal. I had a, a 20 or in the 80s. I was in Minnesota. I had a farmer who went out and put went below, went about five feet down below the frost line, and laid out in his cornfield a geothermal pipe. He heated his home in Minnesota that gets down to 50 below for 10 dollars a year. 
that was the cost of his electricity to run the pump that pumped the geothermal into his house. He did not have to drill a well. And by the way, our fossil fuel companies are very good at drilling. Oh, yeah. So yeah. There, there's an option for the sure. use of that technology. And I'm, I'm sure they're going to discuss that in the next session on energy. They're going to talk about transportation and thermal. Yeah. So we'll, we'll certainly yeah. go into more detail on that. Sure. A couple, couple things from my perspective. Yes, Run of River Hydro is, uh, is in fact, uh, gaining increased attention. Um, there's uh, the Vermont-based Climate Tech Incubator uh, program from two or three years ago had a company based out of Atlanta, I think, and I, the name's escaping me, but they had designed a run a river hydro system for exactly what you're talking about. And this would be, you know, would work in canals, would work in rivers, but open channel flow. Um, so it, it's coming. Um, the question is, when, it, when is it like full, when is it scalable? Um, but, there, but we know that there's evidence out there in the marketplace of those kinds of technologies being developed. And, and advanced. I also wanted to just pick up on the um, the rooftop uh, solar comment, which look, we all agree we should. I, I would love to see every rooftop in Vermont and elsewhere covered with solar panels. Obviously, the issue is twofold: it's the age of the roof and the structural capacity of the building. So if these are flat roofs, they got a 25-year life. We can't go on to a we can't go on to a ten year old roof that's going to need to be replaced in fifteen years if we've got a twenty five year contract to sell the power, which is typically what we need. Um, and then structural capacity, right? A lot of these big warehouse buildings and the big box stores were designed to snow load, and that's about it, with no additional capacity for uh, you know we need another five pounds per square foot roughly for for a flat uh, installation. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, same thing with parking lots. Everybody says, well, cover them, right. you know, cover parking lots with solar. Well, they're twice as expensive because of all the steel. You know, you've got much more steel going up, and therefore you have to have more foundational requirements on sub subterranean. So we're, we're getting there, but they just, you know, in a world where it's all about the cheapest kilowatt hour generated, those projects are, are they're tough to compete. Yeah, nothing, nothing's easy, right? Um, <clears throat> And I, I do just want to not disagree with it all because I, I like the premise of your question. Like, if we all just could do what we best could do, wouldn't we be better off? And the abs absolutely. Um, but I do want to just push back a little bit on the notion that we that we have to do it home by home or building by building in terms of what that building or home could generate. Because I do think it goes back to the concept that in Vermont we could have and should have. We're developing right now a two-way grid system where if you're in a valley and you don't have solar capacity and you're not near a run of river stream you could drop a micro turbine into you know anytime soon with the technology you you can and are still connected to us and we do have a, a clean and getting cleaner portfolio that we can deliver to you we can prioritize making sure the lines to your home are hardened and that you are that you will withstand a storm if it comes in we can put basement batteries or batteries you know in a shed near your house so that you can stay on and um, and then we can manage that through our load control so that at times when uh, we need it, we could actually use the battery in your home to help your neighbors. So I do think there are approaches that could be more cost effective now and possibly even more carbon impactful um, in the long run um, if we keep that sort of interconnected system and don't necessarily uh, expend the resources and the focus on an individual home by home solution. So I just want to put that out there. So I'll answer. I know Chad will have an answer as well. It's not just about expanding grid capacity for generation. We actually have places in the state with more generation than we have load 
and, and those are areas where the generation is being constrained to operate and, um, and, and we're not using it, essentially. So, so when we think of grid investment, we think first and foremost about serving Vermonters' needs, meaning meeting the load requirements that they have in order for them to turn their lights on now and to use their heat pumps and electric vehicles and other systems in the future as, the, as, as again, hopefully electrification <laughs> helps us bring fossil fuel use down. So just with that concept, it's not only about um, having a grid that has more capacity for generation, but having a grid that's balanced. And so that the generation comes online, uh, both here in the state as well as regionally that's available to meet the load that we have. And that it happens, again, 24-7, 365, which is the real challenge. So um, the short answer right now, um, like everything, it's, it's cost and scale. Um, but we are making really significant investments uh, to improve the grid and the whole framework for the conference about looking back to look forward. If we think about what happened after Irene and, and, the, and the types of impacts we had there and what we've done to the grid since, I actually think it's a really hopeful story. It shows a lot of investment, a lot of new systems that are in the state now compared to then. Um, and so if we future cast 10 or 15 years out, I do think we will see an even stronger grid that has the ability to host more generation as well as serve the load um, as Vermonters electrify. Um, right now we do that by spreading costs with all customers who share uh, in the system. Um, and when a generator comes on, if the generator has specific upgrades that are needed, the generator will pay those costs. One thing that we've looked at at Green Mountain Power is whether there are certain costs that can be shared either among generators because, you know, it shouldn't just be Chad with one system and then everybody else benefits behind Chad if they develop a project. Um, or are there ways we can share certain costs between the generators and the customers because we recognize, like Chad said, that some improvements can help everybody. Um, so specific investments, keeping at it. I mean, it's really it is really about cost because we need to keep uh, we need to keep things affordable for customers, and make sure that what we're aiming for is keeping the lights on for them, 24/7, 365, um, and that requires investments in a number of different areas. So I like everything; it's a balance. And I'd like to just add to that because I just recently, so if, if many people all know that every utility has to do it integrate a resources plan every three to five years. And so Northfield is going through its IRP. And uh, we, we looked at the, the forecast for what is the electrification needs in 20 years um, relative to adding heat pumps and electric vehicles to the system. And then I had to take a look at kind of a rough back of the envelope sketch of, OK, given the system that we have built, what is the capacity? Um, is, it, is the system able to carry the capacity of the load and generation? And the answer was, I have two or three times the capacity that I would need, simply because when you build a system, there are certain minimum sizes. And certainly, Northfield Electric is not a GMP. We only have, you have 90,000 customers, we have 1,800. And so, you know, we have a much smaller system to deal with. 272,000. <laughs> no, sorry, <laughs> Maybe I was thinking of, you know, back or something. But uh, so, so in many cases, the system, the grid, as we talk about it, at the distribution level, has the capacity. It's, in many cases, it's the transmission system where you have very large projects. You know, like if there's a 20 megawatt solar farm. Down in uh, down near Coolidge, uh, at, at su southern Vermont, which is actually where, and I don't remember how many thousand, how many acres or hundreds of acres that they had to clear. About 120, acres. About 120 acres of trees that they take down, like that's carbon sequestration right there, for a project that's actually selling electricity out to of out of state. I'll just say out of state. So, so the capacity, generally the distribution system, and Mike, you, you could speak to this as well, generally handles any of the load that we need in the distribution. It's more when you get to the transmission level, where you're trying to move a lot of energy out of an area where you have a big wind farm or big solar farm from an area that's very rural, 
doesn't have much load, you're trying to move it to an area that, that, that has a lot of load. And it's really at the transmission level. The, the only thing I would add, and then, you know, diversity is a big thing with load, A. And then B, we are putting in controls where we can actually control the load. And if it ever did get to a point where we were nervous about it, we could control it and shape the energy to meet it. Uh, the other thing on capacity, I would say, and I know Chad has heard this, uh, we do have a climate plan at Green Mountain Power where we are looking at some of the most rural areas of our territory, which just based on when everyone was electrified, uh, it's time for them to be upgraded and storm hardened. And whenever we do a storm hardened project, it does also increase the capacity of that line as well. So just by natural us trying to get better with resiliency, we're actually also creating capacity room at the same time. Uh, just to close on Erica's question or comment, uh, it really is about the cost. Um, uh, you know, and this is why we're really excited about the federal infrastructure funding coming to Vermont, and you know, the development community and the utilities got together and actually made an ask of the congressional delegation, saying, "Look, this is what we really need." And there were a number of different, you know, a whole b host of of issues because what it comes down to is. It's, I call it the who pays conundrum, right? So if we try to propose a two megawatt solar project somewhere in GMP's grid and, and, and um, you know, th there's an interconnection cost that is assessed by the utility, either the project can support that cost or it can't. And so if it can't, no improvements get made, the project doesn't move forward. Um, so a few years ago, and I think Liz was alluding to this, GMP created this really uh, innovative program to socialize some of those costs. So it wouldn't be just the next developer in line to interconnect a project gets tagged with millions of dollars of improvements that gets socialized around uh, a number of different projects. And we've actually, you know, we've become very active in Maine and New Hampshire and elsewhere. And the state of Maine had this same problem. They, they stood up a, a pretty aggressive solar program a few years ago got all these applications for interconnection and you know central main power and and versant over there they didn't know what to do so we said hey like do what vermont did like create this program to socialize those costs so that really helped but um yeah it's the who pays conundrum because either we pay it or the rate payers pay it and neither is a good outcome Hence, the excitement around this infrastructure funding that can hopefully break down that, that conundrum. Um, so, because we started 25 minutes late, I'm not sure how much later we get to go. So, let me just assume that we're going to, to have about another five minutes. Um, and so, well, we have, uh, we have two people, questions. So, there's people walking towards the door right now. Yeah. <laughs> No viewer. Oh, good. Know. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> did, so yeah, did you have a question? Did any? Do we have a question over here? I do, but I'm happy to ask it after. Okay. Um, well, perhaps. Uh, I'm happy to stick around. Perhaps we should, if if there are people milling they around. Back around the corner, so like. Oh, okay. You know, uh, you might have a you might have time for one So more so let's ha we'll have one more question. I saw your hand earlier. If you want to just shoot. Uh, Hi again, Joel again. Um, and I'm really glad that this concept of uh, cost has started to come up a little bit towards the end of this discussion because it started to jog within my own mind one of the other uh, key tenants, uh, principles of power supply, kind of the flip side of reliability, affordability. You know, that is kind of stuck as jargon within, I think, anyone that studies energy systems. And so one of the questions that I had was, to ask the panel if y'all could reflect on uh, one of the trends in the energy system uh, of deregulation, where we've purposefully disaggregated generation, wholesale, and resale of power to different institutions. Uh, and I guess maybe to speed up some of what I wrote down, how might y'all anticipate this kind of simultaneous trend of deregulation in the energy system uh, and how that affects reliability, uh, or as we're thinking about it, perhaps a little bit more broadly, resiliency, 
you know, it, it, this aggregation favors the big utility scale supplier uh, often because it's cheapest. But as y'all have said, maybe that's not the best strategy for resilience in the long run. So how do we work with that trend? How do we interrupt that trend? Are there barriers or opportunities? So yeah, that's kind of the gist yeah, of my question. Still have a lot of regulation. I was gonna say the good news is we're Vermont, not Vermont Texas. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say. So, so uh, yeah, I know it's this is being recorded, so I'll say it respectfully. But yeah, I, you know, thank God Vermont's not Texas. I guess is uh, one way to think of it. But um, uh, no, in all seriousness, there, there, we could have a really long conversation about what you've brought up. Um, it's incredibly important to think about the regulatory systems that overlay anything like this. Um, and that's not just state level, obviously, that's regional. When, it talk, when you talk about the system operator, federal, uh, both the uh, reliability standards as well as the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, but in Vermont, um, we have chosen a path to stay vertically integrated so that we the, we at GMP do own generation transmission and distribution uh, we you know the large scale transmission is owned by Velco as you alluded to earlier but we have an integrated system and we have a very very active regulatory um, oversight in Vermont that takes takes a look at everything we do um, and that system has worked really well for Vermont. If you look at uh, energy prices, electricity prices in New England, as a region we're high, if you look at the nation, because we have fewer natural resources right here in New England. Um, but within New England, Vermont's story is really good. Um, and over the last 20 years or so, if you look at the bouncing you know, chart of electricity prices, Vermont has been very steady, very stable, and, and lower than uh, nearly all of the other New England states. Maine tends to be low as well. Um, but we are doing a good job on affordability in Vermont, given our context. Um, and we do that because we focus so strongly on it. I mean, everything we do at Green Mountain Power, I can tell you because I've sat around the table there now after being at the state many, many years ago and seeing it from the other side, everything we do starts with how is this going to affect customers? And that gets back to, as we think about the power portfolio, how can we balance our resources to make sure that we have the most cost effective uh, total portfolio. And when we look at, at storm hardening, you know, Mike has spent a bunch of time looking at the cost effectiveness of putting in the tree wire to the place in the valley that doesn't have any other choice right now, um, you know, versus not doing that and looking at what that cost benefit can be over time and saying, yes, we need to make that investment. Um, so short answer is uh, while we have to operate in a regionally deregulated environment the vertical integration we have here is working and we think works going forward and we support it very strongly for that reason and i just like to reinforce that although velco owns the transmission the utilities own velco that's right so which is also unique in, which in, is also in, unique yeah, yes yeah. So and, it's also and it benefits customers okay so we, we're ready to go? Okay. Well, thank you all for your participation. I appreciate it.